This is Whitley Strieber and this is Dreamland. You've reached the edge of the world. Many times on Dreamland, we have explored the idea of that the universe may be a simulation. Riz Verk's been on the show, I think, three times. Now we have two new guests to explore this with, a remarkable man and woman. Bernie Heisch and Marcia Sims. Am, am I pronouncing your name right, Bernie? Heisch is fine, yes. Okay, Perfectly. <laughs> Great. Yeah. All right. And they are a team that I fell in love with immediately upon reading why they are a team. Uh, Bernie has got uh, Parkinson's, and Marcia has become his what I would call muse, writing partner. Uh, and they have evolved a lot of ideas together that I don't think would even exist if this deep partnership hadn't come about. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about them. Bernie is an astrophysicist, a, a very prominent astrophysicist, is the author of 130 scientific publications. He was the editor of Astrophysical Journal for 10 years. He earned his PhD from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, he did postdoctoral work at the Joint Institute for Laboratory Astrophysics at the University of Colorado at Boulder and the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. Uh, he has been a staff scientist at Lockheed Martin Solar and Astrophysics Laboratory. He's been directly to director of the Center for Extreme Ultraviolet Astrophysics in Berkeley. Uh, he's been a visiting science scientist at the Mac Planck Institute for, extra, uh, for uh, Extraterrestrial Physics in mm -hmm. Germany. He was also editor-in-chief for a long time of the Journal of Scientific Exploration. All right. Now, he is, as well, the author of The God Theory and the Purpose Guided Universe. Marcia Sims has a very eclectic background indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Marcia uh, is has been a uh, administrator and deputy Sec department secretary at Lockheed Palo Alto Research Laboratory. She's been the executive editor of the Journal of Scientific Exploration uh, at uh, California Institute for Physics and Astrophysics. Uh, she has been an administrator, graphic artist, and photographer at Many One Networks and Digital Universe Foundation. And they are a husband and wife team, and they work on many projects together, including, interestingly enough, songwriting. They yeah. perform together in a few operettas, and uh, they are have a science company called the Jovian Company. But there's also something else here that we're going to be talking about in a very profound way over the course of the show. It's called love. We're looking at it right now. Those two people. That's love. Aww. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and that's why this is happening. That's what <laughs> makes this vision of the simulated universe so very different and much deeper than the visions that we have explored before. Now, what and we'll you'll find out folks what that means it's not um romantic love there's something else going on here that's real powerful that bernie and marcia talk about in their book and i was thrilled because it's been part of my instinctive understanding of what's going on for a long time okay so let's start and we're going to start at the back of the book at the back of the book, and you'll see why later, folks. And uh, Bernie and Marsha have a wonderful description of what an atom really is. And I think that that's a great place to start because it's going to anchor us, if anchor could even be a word used here, in a concept of reality that is very, very different from what 
we experience every moment of our lives. So I'm not going to ask which one of you wants to talk. It's up to you. But what is an atom and what is really in it? And, and, and an electron, I thought the description of an electron and what and how indeterminacy works was just exquisite. It is. I could start out, Bernie, you can add the scientific terminology that I might have missed. Take a crack it, at it. Yeah, I'll take a crack at it. So there are uh, two views of what an atom really is. Um, the way I was taught when I was in grade school, and this is the way people always thought about it previously to current times, is that the atom was considered to be a miniature solar system with electrons orbiting a nucleus. But now it's viewed much more abstractly. It's now viewed as a nucleus being surrounded by electrons that form a cloud of probability. Probability. That means we're not really sure where an electron really would be at any point in time. But we know this general area where it would be orbiting the nucleus, but we're not sure where. So this really changes our view of reality. Because uh, just imagine if you sit in your favorite armchair, you're not really being supported by atoms that are little miniature solar systems. You're being supported by clouds of probability. Probabilities are numbers that govern physics in our world. In our book, we developed the idea that a matter-based universe can be replaced by a number-based universe. And this leads us to the likelihood that reality is a simulation. Um, we can look back to some other famous scientists, such as Heisenberg, who saw atoms and elementary particles themselves as potentialities rather than things or facts. Yes, if you look back at the uh, comments on the uh, the atomic structure of the particles back in the oh, 100 years ago, you know, um, it became evident that uh, there was uh, something very, very non-classical going on in, in an electron, and other particles too, and that was that there is a, a cloud of charge, I mean, a cloud of probability that determines, in the case of an atom, where the, uh, the orbital electron is to be found. Well, gee, that's, that's a whole lot different than, than looking at this as a solid particle. So uh, it opens up the question of whether other particles, things that think are particles, similarly have a, an indeterminate structure like this. And if they do, well, maybe you can apply that to the, the universe at large, and large and small, and see how the things work out in terms of the, the laws that govern um, uh, an atom or an electron that uh, that are not solid particles that uh, Marshall learned in grade school. Yeah, it's <laughs> possible to imagine that maybe we as human beings are also being supported by, are surrounded by clouds of probability, depending on our free will choice. And that gets me to another question, and it's a question about free will and about the creator of this thing we call the universe. Uh, there's been recently some, uh, uh, let's see, I, I'm, I'm skipping his name, unfortunately, but he was a, he's a prominent uh, uh, neurologist who has concluded that we have no free will, that it doesn't exist. And um, I mean, that, that happens about every five or six years. Someone <laughs> in some discipline comes along and announces this and it gets in all the scientific literature and then it goes away. Um, so, but let's, let me ask you this. Uh, there was a beginning. There must have been. I mean, we, you mentioned the working back to the Big Bang in the, in, in the book and that is to say, when we look backwards in time, we get to a single point, which is immeasurably dense. And who in the world was there before that? Well, in other words, who wanted this? Oh, well, we can read in the New Testament um, in John chapter 1, verse 1, that in the beginning was the logos, or the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. 
it's reasonable to consider the possibility that um, the logos is an expression of thought also. And by the way, that's actually one of the other Greek meanings of the word logos, expression of thought. And that's one of our premises is that um, we, uh, God created the universe as an expression of his conscious thought. And we're sparks of God and we're co-creating our universe along with God as co-creators. And we, we are sparks of God's consciousness. You want to add? Well, yeah, this is a, a, a relatively new version, or not, not a young version. This is a, a really new concept on what the uh, underlying reality might be of the whole universe. You know, if uh, I just mentioned the, the case of the electron, it's really uh, it's, it's nothing solid at all. Well, that seems to apply actually to all sorts of particles in the universe because they all seem to have um, various combinations of of quarks um, and other things in their, nu in their nucleus that uh, are definitely not the, the solid matter kind of things that uh, we've been, we, we had to deal with in physics, you know, back a long ways. So this led me to think about how the entire universe's uh, constituents and its, uh, its laws can be traced back not to uh, solid matter, not physical stuff, but rather to be traced back to there being thought, uh, thought in the universe, thought being the consciousness of God. And uh, so this is something that I think is a, a very interesting and new way to, to follow when you come up with ideas about what the underlying basis is. I don't think it's just particle physics. I've read particle physics a lot, and I, I'm, I'm drifting away from that now because I don't think that that's really the, the base the base of everything. It's, it's, uh, there is more and more stuff that uh, we haven't dealt with yet in terms of consciousness and its uh, effect on creating matter. So, uh, uh, yeah. It, didn't you want to know what we thought existed before? Yeah. Uh, and I, yeah. Uh, <laughs> let me expand on that question a yeah. little bit. Okay. There's a book you don't mention in your bibliography, but you may know uh, Max Tegmark's Our Mathematical Universe. Right uh, on my desk. I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. I see. I see. I've got that on my bookcase. Uh, yeah. Well, he his premise is that math, the the formula that formulas that make up the formation of reality, must have existed before the universe did, because they would have been already there, or the universe wouldn't have formed itself the way it did. Uh, and interestingly enough, this it brings to my mind uh, the wonderful uh, correspondence between uh, 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 Carl Jung and, um, oh darn it, I'm so sorry. I'm, the older you get, the more you drop names. Uh, and I yeah. don't mean I drop the names of actors. You, the, you blank you're them about as you're going to say them. Who uh, are you going to say? Yeah, Wolfgang Pauli. Oh, yay, we got and, it. Okay. <laughs> and and Wolfgang Pauli's uh, immense curiosity about the fine structure constant, the one one thirty seventh mm -hmm. uh, constant that make that is responsible for the whole way things are structured, and uh, there's no reason for it. It's not like the other constants. It comes out of nowhere, and that really bothered him. In fact, he made such a point of it, He, when he was dying, he moved into a certain room in the hospital. It was room 137. I've heard as that, if, yes. Yes, as if to leave behind this question. Synchronicity. Is that what 137 means? Well, this happens to be a, a strength of one of the effects in physics that... Uh, Comes out to be this 137 number. You find it several places. Oh. No one knows what it means. In fact, uh, Arthur Eddington wrote a whole book on this. He called it, it's called Fundamental Theory and was published in, I think, 1946. And uh, this is considered far out for him to be doing this, but he's, he's put a, he uh, published a book that is quite uh, quite interesting. I'll see it at that. <laughs> it just, it's just that it, it, because it has no, there's no, it, it's free floating. There's no physics behind it. It's like uh, 
a flicker of God's mind. Hmm. It just decided, this presence decided, well, that's a good number. Use that. Yeah. And, and here we are. That's interesting. I wanted to mention something about the um, Ein Sof, E I N, and then S O F. It's a term that's used in Kabbalah, and it represents God prior to self manifestation as a divine and endless light. And the term means, Ein Sof, means nothing in the profound sense of no thing. It exists at the lowest possible energy. And Bernie is very, very interested in researching the zero point energy and how to possibly extract energy from it. Well, this is an interesting correspondence to the beginning of the universe because since uh, God existed at the lowest possible energy, could the zero point energy be an expression of God? Yeah, we're so, going to we, we, wait a minute. We got to take a little break here, <laughs> and this is a perfect time to. That's pretty intense. We, yeah. We're going to come right. back, folks, with yeah. a really dis interesting discussion because, for once, uh, we're talking about to people who might have had a glimpse of the face of God. We'll be right <laughs> back. All right. Who are they? Why are they here? What do they want with us? Why is it all so secret? All of these questions are explored in my new book, Them, in an entirely new way. What do Close Encounter reports tell us about what the visitors want with us? What is the military's experience? And can our memories be trusted? Can anything be trusted? Them answers all of these questions in a totally new way. It's available in hardcover, softcover, as a Kindle, and as an audiobook. Read by me. Get them today. And what an incredible Christmas gift. Them, and you can get it from the unknowncountry.com store, signed by me. We're talking to Marcia Sims and Bernie Heche, their new book, The Miracle of Our Universe, A New View of Consciousness, God, Science, and Reality. And we are playing a little bit with this idea, not just of reality, but of God as someone, someone not not. Uh, you know, they say in the book that they chose he to the, as the pronoun. But and I reflected when I thought of that, we don't have a pronoun for God. We don't That's have right. a pronoun because we don't have a, we do not have knowledge, the knowledge necessary to evolve a pronoun for God. But let's <laughs> let's uh, let's go on with what you were saying about that about the Kabbalah. That was fascinating. Well, um, I used to be very content, I suppose, with the uh, Big Bang as the origin of the universe. It seemed like a great discovery, and uh, it was really something that seemed like it would, it would um, cement the right place for us to see cosmology uh, with the uh, Big Bang as the, you know, the basis of it. But uh, if you think about it, it's, it's sort of fundamentally impossible for the Big Bang to be true because what comes before nothing? You have to have something come before nothing in order to make the Big Bang happen. You say, well, the Big Bang happened at uh, you know, 10 to the minus 38 uh, seconds. But um, well, it's, not, it's not going to take care of the problem that before, uh, that time I just quoted here off the top of my head before that, um, there was nothing, nothing really, nothing in the ISOF sense. And so how in the world can anything be created when the, the, the creation point has to exist somewhere before time itself does? Big problem. So God was part of the Ein Sof and he came out of the Ein Sof. He was divine light, endless light. And somehow after things evolved, God became a consciousness. And we can't look further back than the Ein Sof because that's not possible with our comprehension to do that. 
but we can look back to the lowest point at the Ein Sof, and then God evolving out of the Ein Sof into divine consciousness or cosmic consciousness. And then God, we believe, who is part of the Logos, uh, created the zero point energy, the lowest point of energy, and he used, he, she, it, used the zero point energy to create the Big Bang. And then the Big Bang is where our physical universe came from, but it all came out of cosmic consciousness. So where we are right now in our seemingly uh, world of solid matter isn't really as solid as it seems to us. It's because we're part of the simulation right now. It seems very real. Does that make sense? Oh, I don't see this. Yeah. You want to add to that? Did I get it? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> There's many other layers in there about you know how the different universe, the universe is created and the different stars and the solar systems and the planets, etc. Let me say a couple of things about okay. the later topic, which is zero point energy. Um, I'm probably one of the few people to have gotten a grant from NASA this was a, few, a few years ago to, to study zero point energy in the context of some fundamental astrophysical problems. So it was hard to come by uh, research in that area and funding for that. But it, it, it uh, is a, a way that I discovered was um, useful to have in mind you realize that there may be nothing but that at the basis of basis of the universe itself, because what what is there that so neatly um, provides uh, an effect such as the uh, the amount of energy content in the classical zero point field, which you get from quantum vacuum fluctuations. It's easy to do, it's easy to derive. Um, Ready? I think we should explain what the zero point energy really is before yeah. you go on. I want to be sure if everyone understands this term because it's kind of a difficult term, zero point energy. What, the have, what in the world is that? Okay, it's broadly recognized as a vast field of electromagnetic energy. It's also known as the quantum vacuum field or the QVF. And this field represents the underlying energy that is everywhere in the universe, even where there is nothing but vacuum. And it's composed of a combination of every frequency or wavelength that exists. Some are long and others are short. It's perfectly random. It's an infinite source of energy, and it was already known to Einstein and Max Planck. Now, Bernie and this company he formed, along with Garrett Modell, uh, and I'm a part of it. I'm the CEO, and Hugo Trucks is the, is the president. Uh, we believe that the ZPF can be tapped in a way that would provide humanity with an endless supply of totally clean energy without violating the second law of thermodynamics. Our process has nothing to do with heat. It is electromagnetic. Should I go on and explain what this experiment is? Uh, yeah, please do, because I'm very interested on the personal level. All right. Okay, all right. So um, we have this company, and I should... Uh, say its name, it's called Jovion, J-O-V-I-O-N. And if you go to the website, J-O-V-I-O-N.com, you can read about everything that we're trying to do. And if you are really excited about what we're trying to do, we need some support. So we'd love to get you involved with your enthusiasm. But anyway, I want to go back to the fact that the ZPF, an infinite source of energy was already known to Einstein and Max Planck. And uh, that there is a Casimir force that happens when two parallel metal plates are pushed together by an overpressure of the ZPE from the outside of the plates. A Casimir cavity can be created that takes advantage of this force at the nano level is what we would do. So it's very, very tiny. The ZPF can be manipulated through the use of nano-sized Casimir cavities by squeezing out photon energy. Electron orbitals of an atom spiral down inside the cavity and photons are emitted. Our process then sends the photons through a photovoltaic cell and electricity will then be generated. 
So the ZPF acts as a kind of catalyst. And what we would use is we'd use a Casimir generator, which we've already patented. So uh, it will be a game changing, revolutionary clean energy technology that would combat climate change. It would uh, require no fossil or nuclear fuel and emit no waste carbon or harmful byproducts. So it's pretty exciting potential there. Yeah, exactly. Potentiality that we need, we need assistance so that we can build a prototype to really prove that it works. You want to say something? Yeah, I guess I do. That, that, uh, this is one application that, uh, a great one, if, if we can make this work. But um, the, uh, let me hang on. Are you talking about the second law of thermodynamics? Yeah, the second law of thermodynamics is usually interpreted as being, being the sort of thing we're trying to do to be impossible. And it is in general impossible. You cannot you, you cannot you, violate it. You, the lowest energy state of the, uh, the zero point field is everywhere, everything. And uh, that has been thought, the but thought that, has been, been debunked as a possible source of free energy. But it's not if you use a Casimir cavity. A Casimir cavity is such that if you uh, sh shove particles through it, the particles will drop down from the zero, supposed zero energy state to a lower state because their support in, in their orbital existence is, a, is pulled out from under them. So, so it can go lower than zero. You can go below, zero, below the quantum vacuum energy state by simply using Casimir cavities. Casimir cavities are the only thing, as I know of, that has that possibility. So uh, this is, had been suggested to me some time ago, and um, also the quote. Uh, the, 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 I, I think uh, you got it, Bernie. What, he, what he's basically trying to say is that the main criticism we had is you can't get energy out of something that's zero, but you can indeed get below the energy of the zero point energy with the Casimir cavity. With the Casimir cavity, because the longer waves of the zero point energy are not able to penetrate the cavity. They're held on the outside. So that's the idea. Well, I apologize it's a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, difficult to understand from time to time. I, I do have this- uh, um, Is in, Parkinson's. Parkinson's, we, which we makes know. it really kind of difficult to carry on. But carrying on is fine, um, but it's a little bit sloppy now and then. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. You're doing fine. Um, <laughs> Thank but it's you. it's it's a it's a really interesting point. I have a friend, uh, Hal Putoff, who's worked on this same uh, idea of zero point energy for many years. It's a hard nut to crack, though. But I've never heard uh, the, the idea of the use of Casimir cavity. Can you explain to us exactly what such what this is? A, a, a Casimir cavity, because my I always say to my audience, and people get so. They, they they don't understand things and they turn into magical thinking like quantum everything you know you got a quantum ring to cure your warts or whatever <laughs> but, yeah <laughs> uh, uh, but what exactly is a casimir cavity well um first i want to say that we're also very good friends with hal put off and i just spoke with him yesterday Oh, and good. yeah, he's familiar with our uh, project and he's 100% behind it and he's going to endorse our idea. And he thinks that, uh, you know, it really deserves to develop, uh, to be funded enough to develop the prototype. Previously, we haven't had a high enough quality Casimir cavity. We've only used surrogates, but a Casimir cavity, uh, I mean, we're still developing what it is we need, but it's basically two parallel plates that are pushed together by an overpressure of the ZPE from the outside of the plates, if that makes sense. But it has to be very tiny down at the nano size. But it's pressed together because uh, as it gets smaller, as the opening gets smaller, the longer waves of the ZPF or the quantum vacuum field cannot get inside. So it causes this pressure inside. We see this in nature. Um, there is a Dutch physicist, 
it was Heinrich Casimir, is that his name? Uh, is, Heinrich, Heinrich, Heinrich Casimir. Yes. Yeah, Heinrich Casimir. And he was the first scientist that uh, discovered this and, and understood what it was. And this happens uh, what with minerals naturally in nature that you have, have a little mini Casimir cabinet. You can't have it. Yeah. What you need is, a, is either a, a, a plate that's a conductor, perfect conductor, or you have. Um, uh, you have no a second here. Oh yeah, you have dielectrics. Dielectrics of the yeah, dielectrics of the right property. Okay, so we have a we <laughs> have a, an interesting possibility here, and we're going to keep in touch with you. And hopefully, a lot of un unusual people listen to this particular show, and you never know who may come into your lives. Uh, That's right. So hopefully, someone useful will. Um, we have a number of billionaires who listen to the show. So, hey guys, wow. hey gals, hello. Guys, we um, only need two million to build our correct Casimir cavity. And we actually, two days ago, had a conversation with a company called Atomica and Galita, and they think they could build Casimir cavity for us. So, wow. all we need to do is get funded. I mean, one of the biggest problems was trying to locate a company that might be able to manufacture such a cavity. And now we found one, so we just need the funding. Yeah. Yeah. You hear that? Hear that <laughs> out there? Okay. Well, let's, we're going to come up on a break now. And folks, when we're, we get back, we're going we're gonna to shift gears. Remember, I started this show by saying that it, it was essentially about love. And it is not about the kind of love that we think of when we think of love. Mm. There's something else out there. And oddly enough, it probably relates very profoundly to the zero point field. We'll be right back. My new book, Jesus, A New Vision, is not a Christian book. It is not an anti-Christian book either. Very much not an anti-Christian book. It is new, genuinely new, a look at Jesus in his life and what happened afterwards, his resurrection, for the Shroud of Turin is no medieval forgery. It goes all the way back and it does record an extraordinary event that appears to have been a body transforming into a form of coherent light. The science is very strong at this point. And yet, how could that be? What an extraordinary mystery. The life of Jesus is mysterious indeed, but the greater part of the mystery is about us. How is it that a human body could transform in that way. Who accomplished it? Why did it happen? What does it mean to you and me about our lives now? Jesus, a new vision, a new window into a very old way of looking at the truth a way of finding ourselves, perhaps, that we lost a long time ago, but can recover. Jesus and New Vision is available in Kindle format, as a paperback, in audiobook format on Audible and Apple, and as a Kindle and paperback on Amazon. Do go and get it today. Where is the unknown country? Is it out there in the stars? Or is it also somewhere else? Is it in us, in you? Unknown country, join us today. Go to unknowncountry.com right now and join us. Join the questions, join the search, join the adventure 
unknowncountry.com. There's no place like it in the world. We're talking to Marcia Sims and Bernie Heche about their book, The Miracle of Our Universe, A New View of Consciousness, God, Science, and Reality. And we have been chatting, if you can believe it, about fundamental processes that could literally change the world more profoundly than almost anything mankind has ever done. Because if the zero point field can be unlocked and energy drawn from it, basically, that's a new game, a new way of being. Now, I say way of being. I want to start in, in a kind of a funny place. Marsha, you've had a near-death experience. Yes. <laughs> want me to tell you about it? Yeah. I want to start with that. And and oh. we're going we're gonna to circle around and... We're going to do a lot of circling here, but let's let's start there. Oh yeah, that that's fine. So uh, I'm glad to share it because it's very unusual and it's uh, something that really opens people's mind to the other side of the veil. When I was 16 years old, I was vacationing for the weekend with uh, another family and my family, and we were at a beach. Uh, just south of Aptos, south of Santa Cruz on the California coast. And it was spring break and the weather was a bit volatile and it turns out the ocean was also very volatile. And we were body surfing. I love to swim and I thought, oh, this is great. I've always wanted to swim, always do swim. I swim continuously now several times a week. But in that case, I was being uh, a little too trusting or naive about the power of the ocean. And uh, so I was body surfing with my friends and this huge, huge wave just crashed over me and pulled me under. It was a horrific undertow. And it happened so fast, like I couldn't even stand up anymore. Suddenly my feet were just way off the bottom of the sand. And I was pulled out to sea. I could not fight this current. And it was very terrifying. I mean, I was screaming for help. My friends were on the beach. They were yelling. They were trying to get someone to help me. My parents came running. And there I was just in the water swimming. And fortunately, I could swim. And I just kept paddling around. But I couldn't get out of the undertow. And I, I think I was pulled out, I'm guessing, maybe about a quarter of a mile. And the shore was really distant and it's small. And I, you know, like looking at the people on the shore, they're like little ants. And um, just when I was actually at my most desperate uh, uh, point of feeling, suddenly this wonderful halo of love just surrounded me and poured upon me. And I went into this other alternate dimension where I could see the faces and hear the voices of my ancestors all around me. It was like this family encircling me of who I was, who, who, who uh, I might be a part of, who existed before me. And they told me, part of it was in my mind, part of it I heard with my ears, Marcia, it's not your time to die yet. We're going to help you. Just relax and we'll keep you afloat until health or help arrives. So I did. I just kind of laid back and floated on my back and just felt this luscious warmth supportive love and it was kind of a pink white light all around me and their voices are there the faces were there and I didn't even have to swim it was amazing and before long while I was basking in this halo of love who should turn up but a surfer who arrived to help me on a surfboard uh -huh. <laughs> there he was 
sent by God. Had to have been. This guy was just surfing on a nearby beach and he heard all the commotion. I don't know. He might have been at the same beach, but he was a distance away from me. And he uh, pulled me onto his surfboard. And instead of going against the current, he went across the current and then circled around back to the beach. In the meantime, my dad had tried to go out and save me in an inner tube, and he also had gotten caught in the riptide. And a second surfer arrived and rescued him. Oh my so, God. so we were saved. But this experience really opened my ability to see the other side of the veil called death. I got my glimpse of what is beyond the physical realm, and it was quite beautiful. And it opened my eyes to other experiences I've had in my life. When I was uh, a little older, like around 19, I had a very uh, high fever. It was close to 103, which is a very, you know, very high temperature for a human being to have. And I went into this trance. It was like a uh, yogic uh, kind of trance. And uh, sat up in bed, didn't even know what was going on. And I just got swept back into the beingness of who I was before Marsha. And I actually counted that I went through 32 past lives. Oh, my God. I can't remember all of them, but some of them I definitely do, the more prominent ones. So yeah, tell us about the ones that stand out. <laughs> oh, I'm not okay. I'll tell you as nicely as I can. I mean, the, the one that stands out, the one before me was uh I was a Jewish operetta singer who lived in Vienna. And I saw myself being on stage, doing productions. Uh, I, I believe I sang in the Viennese Operetta House, not the Opera House, but the Operetta. My voice, this life is kind of crossed between opera and operetta. I'm an opera singer now, by the way. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I sing in community opera theater called Verismo Opera. We're doing Louisa Miller, and I'm singing the contralto role of Federica. We open on November 4th. Oh, I Lego. love opera. I'm a huge fan. Oh, you are. Oh, oh I yeah. wish you could come. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was a, a Jewish uh, operetta singer during World War II. And uh, I had all the glory of that life, except, unfortunately, um, I was sent off to Theresienstadt for a while as a performer. And then I got sick and I was sent to Auschwitz. And that was it. End of oh, that, yeah. Marsha. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's what I really remember. I also remember, uh, it, this is an interesting one, uh, Chinese life, where I was uh, sitting on the banks of the Yangtze River, casting yarrow sticks known as the I Ching, and seeing the world of probabilities then, and trying to figure out what was going to happen in the future for that life. And I see this man looking at me, and that man saw me, and there's this, still this connection. He could see who I was going to be, and he probably could see me on this show with you, Whitley. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bernie, how yes. do you react to this level of this? Because, you know, our overriding theme is a different kind of love a, a, that is actually a, a, a almost a power beneath physics and when we are touching on things like near-death experience and survival of consciousness we are looking at something that has been built almost a world that has been built to new, nurture these fragments of consciousness that are us. And it, it, so where does that kind of love come from? The love that that is so powerful that it 
probably brought this about. Right. <clears throat> we were sort of going around in circles on this. Yeah. But I think a direct, a direct hit is warranted here. Um, I think that there is a, the question is, um, do you have free will? And what would be the purpose? What could be the purpose of, uh, of, of having being a creature that's in this universe with, with love as, as a basis? Um, the purpose of our existence here, I think, has to do with, uh, with God's creative ability. Um, mm. God is, I think, looking for experience that uh, is gotten only through this, uh, this realm. It's only through a, a, a deep use of an energy, which, which he calls love, the same thing you're just talking about. So the reason that we're here is because God can't do everything as a God. I mean, think for example, of God wanting to go skiing. Well, uh, could God go skiing? Well, the problem is that, uh, you know, his appearance and his, uh, his uh, gear is all, all wrong for going skiing. He can't do it. But could he go skiing on, on a mountain that had been created by him for the, uh, the ability to make physical things come, come to life? Sure. I think that's the whole point, that God wants to bring to life the creative things that he is capable of and has and created, created in, in the past. And he's searching for ways to experience that to make himself greater and grander and uh, more um, more loving, I suppose. So, so it's, yeah, I want to explain that how God experiences skiing. You didn't quite complete that. So oh, yeah. we are the eyes and ears of God. So God experiences skiing through Bernie, who loved used to love to ski. He did. I did. Yeah, yeah sure he, did. he. God experienced skiing through Bernie and through me and through anyone else who skis. And so this is it's a, a very exhilarating experience. It's <laughs> a way of looking at things that you, you almost need to have. Here. That um, you need some kind of a way for the existence of uh, things that God creates or could create as fundamental to the purpose of the, of the entire universe. Why else would God do some of these crazy things that we experience? And that makes us the experiencer, which then gets passed back to God when we die. So, yeah, we believe that God created the energy of, of, of love and he used this energy of love create the universe and it's not just a warm fuzzy feeling but it's a really powerful force you keep asking about love so i want to just uh talk a little more about it so yeah yeah, yeah. so there's an yeah. infinitely great power of love which makes things happen with a force greater than any we know of in physics so yes at some level the laws of physics are subordinate to the laws of love and this is consistent with the idea that creation and the universe itself are manifestations of consciousness. We propose that love enhances consciousness in a strong emotional expression. And that's what love is to we as human beings. It's a strong emotional expression, but it's more than just that. It's God's love for us is even stronger than our human level of love. I guess it's with, with a certain amount of love embodied in God, he can he can uh, exercise the creative ability that he has and make things happen that they're not they're not real in the same sense as we consider particle physics being made of things that are real. But the th thing that I uh, believe is that God is um, well, uh, he has this ability, and that this is the point of his bringing creatures. To life in, in a universe, and because of his love, and he could love us. He could love us. Yeah. And so this this love is a very different kind of thing. I don't pretend to understand it. I mean, it's kind of taking me by surprise. I don't really <laughs> understand it, but I, I've heard it said, and I, I I believe that the looking on love as being a uh, a manifesting force that creates everything, including both the subatomic particles and and the galaxies. Uh, that this is a way that. We can understand how God can be in this great infinite thing that fills the universe and where that leaves us. It gives us a very important role, by the way. If we are the things that God uses to experience himself, oh, that gives us a heck of a lot of power. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's no kidding. God <laughs> no kidding. Creates, this, creates this in order to 
have experience. And you know what's interesting about the whole arc of our discussion? We started out uh, talking about this kind of formless essence that was there uh, when we discussed the, the ideas that come from the Kabbalah. And then it, it, we, it gradually forms into a, a, a sort of self-awareness and then begins to seek experience in the world, to create a world to seek experience in. That's exactly like a, a, a birth. It's a birth, like a, you know, the, the, the shadowy beginnings of awareness in the womb, followed by an eventual explosive birth, the Big Bang, which the baby's in peaceful existence kind of explodes in his face. And then uh, the long journey of life. And it, 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 I think the you, what you're saying here basically is the universe itself is now on in uh, that long journey in life. And we are coming to the middle of life. And it, it haunt the, the haunting words of the beginning of Dante's Inferno uh, come to <laughs> mind. Uh, he found himself in the forest. The path was lost. Now, that gets me where I'm going. What about heaven and hell? And what about negative experience? Does God want that? <laughs> well, of course, I'm put in a position of uh, In other words, was God with the SS who put you into Auschwitz? And well, not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think Those the problem great. is that you can't you can't have anything anything that's really good without having something bad to, to offset that. Exactly. Um, so the, if you try to have a universe in which only good things happen, it would eventually become a very very dull universe. You, can, you just can't do that. Unless you allow for the existence of negativity, which can sometimes be horrible, I suppose, and something you wouldn't expect God to do, but He keeps, keeps hands off. I think the free will, free will, is the is the fundamental thing that uh, makes this whole system work. Well, we need to kind of give a little definition of what heaven and hell is, because we don't use the traditional Christian terminology for heaven and hell or the description. Uh, because we do believe that we have more than one life, uh, heaven is really, to me, and you can add to this, Bernie, heaven is a place where we go between lives to be with God, to renew ourselves, to be with our spirit guides, to review our lives in the Hall of the Kashic Records, see how we did. Not just up a bit. Yeah, not just as up a bit. And, um, then we determine what it is we want to do our next life. And we have a lot of consultations with angelic beings, spiritual guides. And we choose what it is that we're going to experience in our next new life. And we make these decisions. But even when we are born into the physical world, we still have free will to change the course of our lives if we want to. But we do make plans. So. Heaven is, I think, it's a really beautiful place to be, and we get to share experiences with other angelic beings and other souls that are like us. But it's in the traditional Christian sense where God is a desert patriarch sitting on a throne with a staff, and you know, there he's sitting on a bank of clouds, and angels are floating around him playing harps. I mean, I think there are angelic voices, and there's a lot of music on the other side, but it's not the way that I was taught when I was in Sunday school. Uh, but then with regards to hell, hell is claimed to be an everlasting realm of torment reserved for humans who have committed grievous offenses against God often referred to as immortal sins, mainly by Catholics. By the way, Bernie trained to be a Catholic priest when he was younger, so he's really up on oh, the God. Catholic concept of hell. Catholic. I'm a, I, I'm, I'm a uh, lapsed, fallen away, not quite fallen away Catholic too. 
Well, there's a lot of really nice things in the Catholic Church, by the way. Exactly. I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, free dreamlanders, we have come to the end of our time together. Our partnership will end here and uh, come back next week. Enjoy the show. And as always, uh, I rather hopelessly ask you because of this about 60,000 of you who have been listening for years and have never subscribed to Unknown Country, give it a shot. There's much more adventure available behind the paywall on Unknown Country, including a wonderful, warm community that will, some of them have become lifelong friends because they met on UC, and also the vast, vast wealth of information and interviews just like this that you simply can't hear anywhere else. Thank you very much, as always, for being with us. You've been listening to Dreamland. Be sure to tune in again next week. Dreamland is brought to you by UnknownCountry.com and its family of subscribers. Our theme music is The O of Pleasure by Ray Lynch. Unknown Country was founded by Ann Streber. Our news editor is Matthew Frizzell. Our coordinator is Amy Safrankova. Whitley Streber is your Dreamland host, and I'm your announcer, Ted Alexander.